is The Pastor's Heart and Dominic Steele and Modern India, Hindus, Christians and the Bible with Vishal and Ruth Mangalwadi. Today, understanding modern India, understanding the Hindu and how we might see our Hindu friends saved. Vishal Mangalwadi is India's foremost Christian intellectual. He's authored more than 20 books. He's here with his wife Ruth in Sydney and has been speaking at the Satya Conference, which is concerned to reach subcontinentals with the gospel. Vishal, Ruth, thanks for coming in. Uh, I wonder if we could start. There has been a massive increase in uh, people from the Indian subcontinent immigrating to Australia. Um, why do uh, immigrants from non-Western countries want to make that shift and why are we seeing it in increasing numbers at the moment? The, uh, thanks to the evangelical movement, uh, education came to India and uh, we have uh, very good educational institutions in the early phase, all of them started by Western missionaries and English became the medium of instruction. But India does not yet have the capacity to make use of the skilled manpower and brain power. So um, many of them are coming uh, because there is not enough employment opportunities in India. Now that's very interesting. You say it was the missionary and the evangelical movement that in the end was the engine room of change. Um, and so can you just unpack for us the significance of the missionary movement, William Carey, those kind of people? The concept of logos that in the beginning was not silence, but in the beginning was the word and our gift of language and words is given to us because we are made in God's image. Uh, this is what St. Augustine in the 5th century, he had uh, understood that the difference between man and animal is language. That our minds are made in God's image, therefore to be godly, one has to cultivate the mind. Mm -hmm. And that's why medieval universities became, uh, th these medieval monasteries and nunneries became different from Hindu ashrams or Buddhist viharas in that when you went into a Buddhist uh, center of learning, you were learning how to silence your mind, how to empty your mind. Uh, but when you went to a Christian monastery, particularly Augustinian, Cistercian, Franciscan, you were studying philosophy language, grammar, trivium and quadrivium, uh, literature, to cultivate your mind because if you are supposed to manage God's creation, you have to uh, uh, understand creation. He's your father, you're like him, he has given you the authority to govern his creation. So. Uh, the um, uh, monasteries became the centers that cultivated both the heart and the mind. A student learned uh, to fast and pray and study the scriptures, but he also cultivated his mind. Out of many of these monasteries grew universities. But this did not happen in all of Indian history. No Hindu ashram ever became a university. There were some large centers of learning for Buddhism, uh, but in those centers, although much scripture was written, scripts were written, but basically you were learning how to empty your mind. So when the missionary movement came, um, particularly the Protestant missionaries, so every child must be educated. This was the heart of the Protestant Reformation because of which Protestant nations in Europe became much stronger than Catholic or Orthodox mm. nations. And that revolution was brought to India by the missionary movement. And it was really Ruth William Carey who kicked yes, us off with that. Yes. Tell, tell us, just describe to us what was happening as Carey started to do his thing in India. Mm. Yeah. You know, I was guilted into writing about William Carey because this American missionary said, it's the 200th year mm -hmm. of his coming to India. And I can't find a woman to write about his contribution to what he did for women's education, infanticide and uh, widow burning. 
Yeah, well, let's talk about those three things in turn. Mm -hmm. What difference did Carey bringing the gospel message and education that Vishal's just spoken about make to the issue of, well, let's first talk about widow burning. How Mm -hmm. did it change that practice? He fought for it. He fought for many years. He was first very disturbed when he saw this um, frantic group of um, people burning this young widow. And they were chanting so loud and he was protesting, but no one heard him and really bothered him. But then I think he was in touch with Wilberforce back in England mm-hmm. and trying to enact a law to ban this. Uh, so you've got Wilberforce. I mean, we always hear about Wilberforce, but yeah. we don't hear in Australia as much about Kerry and the evangelicals bringing that about. Right. Yeah. And it was fascinating because I was forced to write into it and I was write about him and I was really glad that I was because then you make these connections and the networks he had and Mm -hmm. the people in England helping him. So it was in 1829 when the um, law was passed banning Banning widow burning. What about infanticide? Yeah. Yeah, he, poor man, he was so horrified when he saw this basket up in a tree and he asked that it be brought down and in it was a half-eaten baby a termite. I think if you didn't want a baby or if it was a girl, uh, you know, you could just hang the baby up in a, a basket in a tree. And then a and termite it, or someone yeah, could some, get it. Yeah, and birds. It. And birds. Crows. So, yeah. Right. so he was so horrified. All this was so alien to him. And then the practice of pushing babies down the um, river on a... On a festival. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they offered their children as sacrifices and this was so horrifying to Kerry. So he wanted to do something about it, but then the whole thing of, you know, how do you meddle with the religious practice? But he knew this was evil. This was not just a cultural thing. And so. your average Hindu today, uh, whether they're a Hindu in Australia or a Hindu in, in- India, would they know that it was actually evangelicalism and the gospel that stopped these practices? Yes, that's precisely why uh, many Hindus want to revive the tradition of sati. Well, I was horrified to hear this. Mm, Yes. So there's actually, is this really true? There's a move to reinstate these practices? Yes. In 1987, a 18 year old widow, Roop Kavar. I mean, I uh, was, must have been living under a rock because I had not heard this until. <laughs> exactly. Uh, in Rajasthan, which is west of Delhi, this young w- woman was burnt alive on her mm-hmm. husband's funeral pyre. And the Hindus, in hundreds of thousands, wanted to make her a goddess. So there was a ceremony plan to make her a goddess because this was used to be the tradition and they wanted the tradition revived that the British had banned one of our religious customs and uh, now that we are free, we should be freed from this European legislation uh, interfering with our religious tradition. So I got involved in fighting that and thankfully the press was supporting me, national Mm. press, and then the government, Rajiv Gandhi and the president, I had to act because in Delhi we were able to mobilize pressure um, and that is actually what uh, got us started studying William Carey because uh, I wanted to understand how uh, uh, the law was banned in 1829, what were the arguments used used back then. Um, And it continues. So although as a result of what we did in 87, a law was passed making, uh, uh, becoming stronger against widow burning. Uh, so they have not yet built a temple for that particular girl who was a widow who was burnt alive. But every day there is worship there. Uh, there's a platform and it's on live on Google. You can uh, watch it. You can watch it. So every single day people go and worship her uh, where she was burnt alive. Uh, so they are treating her as a goddess, although it is illegal. Right. Um, so where now would you say, what now would you say is the state of Christian influence in India 
at the moment as a summary overview? Well, in Australia, as in America, uh, there are probably more female Indian doctors, uh, physicians, than American uh, women, Caucasian right. women doctors. Uh, considering that 100 years ago there were no women doctors in India, uh, this was um, um, uh, an English woman, Edith Brown, and an American woman, Ida Scudder, who started medical colleges, medical uni coll yeah, training programs in India, in India which has grown. So the upper caste women will not become nurses because that's considered dirty, but they would become physicians. Um, but they don't know how this change happened. The idea that men and women are equal and both and are women made, should be educated. Women so. should be educated. So when William Carey and particularly Hannah Marshman, his colleague, so it was Carey, Marshman and Ward, and Marshman and Ward, their wives were involved in the community. Um, uh, Hannah Marshman was the one who was starting schools, education for women. So the people began to say, you're educating women, you might as well try and educate cows, because this cannot be done. Uh, uh, people, they, the Hindu in back the Hindus, then was arguing that position. Yeah, yeah they, I, mean, they, I feel like putting that argument is quite a strong apologetic argument to mount to a Western woman today. Yes, because Western women do not realize, and Western men don't know, that the idea that men and women are equal is a peculiar biblical idea. Mm. Islam doesn't have that idea. Uh, one man can marry four women in Islam, but one woman cannot marry four mm. men yeah. because men and women are not equal. So how do you go, Ruth, when you're talking to female friends and you share with them, female, female Hindu friends, and you share with them some of your research? Do you know, what, what's their reaction? But where we lived in the village, it wasn't on an intellectual level, it was very practical, mm. but um, that's how I related to women, mm. on a very practical, caring for their children yeah. and caring for them as people, as uh, women made mm. in God's image. Mm. Yeah. So, well, Ruth is very modest, but actually, before we discovered William Carey, Ruth began a very important fight against female infanticide. Yeah. She found a, a young girl being uh, killed, starved to death Do, by her parents. Tell me what happened. Yeah, I was just going house to house, you know, in these mud huts, and um, I asked a child. I asked this child how many brothers and sisters he had or she had, and she said three, maybe four. So then I, I said, "Why? Why did you say that?" She said, "One's almost dying." So I said, "Can I come and see her?" So I went into this mud house and it was all dark and there was this frail little baby, all skin and bones, just covered and she was alive. And it just brought tears to my eyes and I said, why aren't you treating her? So they said, she's almost dead, you know, she's got diarrhea, she's absolutely dehydrated. So then I brought Vishal into the picture and then we took her to the hospital, very reluctant very um, parents are really reluctant to do that, but uh, anyway, reluctant she, because they didn't really want her to live. They couldn't. They didn't believe that she could live, and you know they already had a daughter, and this one was probably a mistake. You know, because they didn't value her as a woman. Right. Yeah. yeah. When Ruth started giving milk to the mother, uh, paying for the mm -hmm. milk for the girl. The milk was given to the boys, but not to the girl. Oh. And we fought for several months before they finally killed her. And they, that, did, they did kill the yes, baby? Let her die. Oh, dear. Well, no, it was more than that. Um, but it, uh, that was only the first experience. Ruth didn't believe that any parent can kill their ch children. Mm. Uh, th uh, but it was clear to me from the beginning that oh, this, was, yeah. uh, this <laughs> was a case of female infanticide. But this happened to several other children with which, whom we got involved. Mm. Finally, our own carpenter, uh, he had uh, twin daughters born. And Ruth was giving a lot of clothes to the mother to comfort her. And I told her that mother is cursing God, she's cursing her fate, she's cursing her babies. 
she won't let them live. Uh, Ruth didn't believe me, but uh, next day the, both the girls were dead. Uh, so it, it took a long time for Ruth to really understand the, the female infanticide is a very common practice in our part of India. Later we found out that many parts of India, in some of the South India, Thil, uh, Andhra for example at that time, uh, mothers would give poison um, juice to the baby Mid to kill the baby. midwives. And um, it, it, killing a child is very simple. If it's too hot, you leave her in the sun. If it's too cold, you leave her uncovered and the child is dead. So uh, the, the, the idea that men and women are equal and that God loves them so much that Jesus will shed his own blood to give them abundant life, give them eternal life. Uh, this was is a gospel mm. for the women. And then the way the gospel has opened up the uh, uh, mind of Indian women. So actually India was very fortunate uh, that we had Mrs. Indira Gandhi, a woman, as our prime minister before America uh, appointed the first lady as the vice president. Mm. So uh, the change in India that the gospel brought about is very powerful, but very few people are talking about it. What is the status of women in India now? India is referred to as Bharat Mata, mother. Yeah. So I, it, it's a strange um, mixture where uh, we have so many goddesses mm -hmm. and yet the place of women is so inferior. So she's deified in the abstract but demeaned in reality. You know, so we live with this, uh, you know, so many goddesses doesn't mean that a woman is uh, valued. You know, that's, we did a study on that. So, and yet I think women are very strong. Indian women are very strong. And despite all these um, things going against them, they managed to flourish. The women are Indian in Australia, who's a university educated professional. How does she react to this kind of story? She probably has no idea of how she got educated and how she was given the opportunity to develop the difference that the gospel made to India because the Indian church has not been writing the history of mm -hmm. India. Modern India is a product of the gospel, a fruit of the gospel. Therefore, militant Hindus want to change the constitution. They want to change the name India because the name India comes from Latin Bible. The book of Esther refers to India as the last province mm -hmm. of the Persian Empire. But it took me 27 years to realize, since I began studying William Carey, it took 27 years to realize that he is the father of modern India. Mm. Because historians describe him as father of modern missions. Not that he was the first missionary, but that he triggered the modern missionary movement yeah. through his book, in, which was published in 1792. And he came to India as the missionary. So he's acknowledged as the father of modern missions. But this is because church historians don't know Indian history. Mm. So they can't call him the father of modern India. You know, I mean, I, I think I've read a biography of Carey years ago. And I don't really remember any of this stuff that you're talking about today. Yes. <laughs> so, so, so our book has just been published. Yep. The father of modern India, yep. William Carey. Because when we were growing up, we were told Mahatma Gandhi was the father of modern India. So you're saying it's not Gandhi, it's Kerry. Yes. Uh, 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 Gan Gandhi was a product. Move over. Fruit Gandhi. of <laughs> what Kerry began. So, uh, for example, Mahatma Gandhi's great contribution to India was Sarvodaya, uplifting the downtrodden. That came because one, he spent a whole night reading John Ruskin's book, Unto the Last and paraphrased it in Gujarati, uh, that when Jesus is saying that what you do, did to the least of these so you're people... Saying, you're saying Gandhi got that from Jesus? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, Gandhi's non-violence, pacifism came from Quakers when he went to England. 
even his vegetarianism came in England. He learned vegetarianism in England. He was eating meat in India. Right. Um, but particularly the concept that government and society should be structured to uplift the lowest of the low, uh, that came from Jesus saying in Matthew 25, uh, that whatever you've done for, for the, the least, least of these yeah. brothers, you've done for me. So someone in Johannesburg gave him a copy of uh, John Ruskin's book, Unto the Last, which he read in the train overnight. Mm -hmm. And he was so moved because this was complete antithesis of Hindu culture. Uh, Hindu culture is not built on the command, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Or love the vulnerable or the... It is... It, it teaches you must despise your neighbor as untouchable. Don't touch him, don't sit with him, don't let his shadow fall on you, uh, don't drink the water that he has touched, don't allow them to take water from your well. So this was the culture in which he had grown up, that uh, to be spiritual means to despise your neighbor as untouchable. So when he reads the uh, Ruskin's exposition of uh, Christ command the true spirituality. Wouldn't it be lovely to see in our lifetime the gospel break down the caste system and break down that? It, it is bound to happen if there is a free and fair election. Uh, the militant Hinduism will be thrown out in the coming election, which has to happen within the next 12 months. But uh, the problem is that militant Hindu knows, uh, knows, knows this, this. And so they're and fighting. They're Last for, gasp fighting. Well, a civil war is possible in India. Um, Large-scale violence to justify overthrowing the constitution mm. and to impose an authoritarian rule, a fascist rule in India, this is the game that the government is playing and therefore it is uh, very painful for us to see the Prime Minister of Australia or the President of the United States they have of been America. They've up, haven't they? Yes, yeah. mm -hmm. because they, are, they can only, they need India as a counter force to China and they need India as a market. Uh, the secular humanists don't actually believe in human rights. They pay lip service to human rights, but as the Declaration of Independence said in America, uh, that we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal mm. and are endowed by their creator with inalienable rights. Unless human rights are given by God, a person has a right to life because God has said you shall not kill. He has an mm. inalienable right. A person has a right to property because God has said, you shall not covet your neighbor's property. You want a good vineyard, may build mm. your own. Don't covet your mm. neighbor's. Uh, don't steal. Yep. That's the source of the inalienable of fundamental rights. Now, we could keep going on this for quite a while, but we're running out of time. And when I told some friends I was getting you into talk to you today, they said, you've got to ask him about Oppenheimer. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. Do you want to start, Ruth? <laughs> Did you, you, yeah, you, Michelle. Well, yeah. uh, so I went to see it in preparation for this interview. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, just uh, last month, or was it this one? That, uh, it's two, rated so much bigger than two, Barbie in, two, in India. <laughs> yes, two Hollywood movies were released in India. Barbie and Oppenheimer, and in the very first week, Oppenheimer, which is a boring film, made two and a half times Barbie, with Barbie. which hasn't happened <laughs> in the West. Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, the reason why for, is that? <laughs> well, the reason for that is that Hindus are very pleased that a physicist of the stature of Robert Oppenheimer, uh, who the father of the atomic bomb, he was reading Bhagavad Gita in Sanskrit. This is a sacred mm -hmm. scripture, and he was studying Sanskrit uh, to uh, resolve his inner moral conflict, because this uh, responsibility to build the atom bomb triggered a nightmare in him that am I starting a chain reaction 
which will destroy the world because Russia is bound to build mm. a, a bomb and then others may follow. But it, it, the film is a Russia-American conflict, mm. a lot of it which actually doesn't interest the uh, average Indian. No, because I was really surprised to hear that it had been yes. such a big hit in Because th this is a uh, Cold War era, yeah. but that um, meaningless and irritating clash mm. between Russia, uh, which is happening in the film. Uh, Indians can't relate to it, but it shows how irrational U.S. government can become. Mm -hmm. A lot of that debate is very irrational, uh, and in fact, they're making f the film is making fun of the American. Well, Truman looks uh, very unattractive. Intelligence, yeah. mm -hmm. but overall, the nightmare that Oppenheimer had uh, has come true. That not just Russia has built atom bomb, but North Korea has, mm. Pakistan has, India has, and India and Pakistan being nuclear weapons, when President Bill Clinton came to Kashmir, he said that this is the hottest spot, hottest spot in the world mm. in terms of global geopolitics because this could trigger a nuclear war. And right now the militant Hindus who are as arrogant right now as Goliath was mm. uh, when um, Israel um, was being oppressed, uh, they do not realize that cultivating a spirituality of hatred, which in India has become as irrational as American hatred for Russia during the Cold War, this could trigger a nuclear war and destroy the subcontinent. But the reason Hindus love the movie is that he reads as he's struggling with this issue that am I starting a chain reaction that will destroy uh, uh, the world? Uh, he doesn't turn to the Bible for mm. resolution. He's a Jew, yeah. a liberal Jew, but he doesn't turn to the Bible. He turns to Gita. And in Gita, the central issue is, the, is identical. Uh, one of the warrior champion Arjuna he does not want to fight against his cousins, Kauravs, and he says uh, this is a fight for five little villages, mud huts Hasti of Hastinapur. Is, are those villages so important that I should kill my uncles, my teachers, my cousins, uh, have this war? Uh, Arjuna, who is the incarnation of Vishnu, he gives him the discourse that you are a warrior, your duty is to fight and kill. I am death and destruction. Mm -hmm. God is the destroyer. I am the death and destruction. So you as an individual should not be bothered with, uh, should not allow your conscience to raise moral issues. You do your duty. So the concept of conscience is killed by Bhagavad Gita. Uh, and um, Oppenheimer has to silence his conscience. In the movie, it silences Oppenheimer's conscience. conscience. But what is uh, not average Hindu, uh, average Hindu doesn't understand all of this, but what he does love is the fact that Oppenheimer is not turning to Jewish scriptures or Christian scriptures, although he's in America, he's turning to Hindu scriptures to resolve this moral dilemma. Right. Thank you so much for coming in and sharing that with us here. Yeah. Ruth and Vishal Mangalwadi have been our guests on The Pastor's Heart. And uh, as we said, um, Vishal is, uh, well, India's foremost Christian intellectual. And it's been great to have you come and share with us. Thanks for joining us on The Pastor's Heart. And we will look forward to your company next Tuesday afternoon.